Oh, good to see you, Alice. Glad you're here. Thank you. Glad you're here. Good to see you. All right, glad to have everybody here today. It's a little bit more comfortable in here than out there, don't you think? <laughs> Getting more humid out there by the minute. Let's see what we have here today. Sunday School After Morning Worship, Ladies Meeting Friday, July 21st, that's 11 a.m. Next week's July, folks. Church Picnic, August 26th. And let's get to our prayer list here this morning. You know, first on the list, um, you know, Cody and Lily Johnson had a baby uh, a couple weeks ago. And uh, the baby's really having a hard time, uh, having a hard time with his her lip. Little his little lungs and holding down food and so we need to keep this baby in prayer. Very, very serious. And uh, Reverend Bob Smith, I believe, did he come home yesterday? Do you know? Uh, you don't know? Or, I don't know. Yeah, Reverend Bob Smith's been in the hospital for a few days. He fell, didn't break anything, okay, but he was hospitalized and I think he was coming home yesterday. Here's Gary and Melanie Klingbeil, uh, their address. Uh, you know, they're the, the young couple that sat there in front of Larry and Bertha. And uh, they would bring their little girl Chloe with them. And uh, Debbie Burns' daughter. So anyways, there's the new address over there in Malwa, New Jersey. Just above Yonkers, New York. John Seaman, recovering from an amputated foot. Of course, that is Helen, her cousin, Kim Vale Shingles, Fred Chubb, several health complications. Boy, it was great to see Aaron and Jimmy last week. We'll probably see them yet today, maybe. No, he's working today. Oh, he's working today, okay. But at any rate, uh, that's really such great news. Uh, the baby's good, the amniotic fluid's stable. Uh, great answer. Betsy Warmoth is doing good. She's being treated for this lump in her throat. And has as positive attitudes you can have, which is great. Betty Warmoth, difficulty, fluid, etc. Hey, Jack, I have senior came home yesterday after having <coughs> his foot amputated. And uh, boy, I'll tell you, he, he's so grateful for the church and your prayers and support. And uh, he gets choked up when he talks about it. So that's great. Keep him in prayer. Chancel Suski having a hard time. Shauna Snyder. Uh, Jeff Swigert, we talked about him. He was a pastor at our conference. He, he's retired now. But uh, Jeff's having triple bypass surgery tomorrow. And I talked to him the other day. He said just going from his chair to the bathroom he said it's the most intense pain. It's just uh, unbelievable. He said, never felt anything like it in my life. So he really needs to get this done and get it done tomorrow. This is pretty emergency surgery. Uh, Steve White, of course, is home. Jeff Coons being treated. Art Wilson is in hospice. Our buddy Tom Gallowitz needs to gain some strength. Glenn Ritchie, PA. <coughs> the center is the Church of the Week. Ron Anderson of the European Christian Mission International. <coughs> Missionary of the Week, and Ray Compton is our Senior of the Week. Anybody ought to be added to our prayer list here this morning. The world. The whole world. Yeah, Lisa. I just found out this morning that the guy who works at Bed Nash, Guy, is his name. He's the one that has all the funny costumes and yeah. he's always oh, he um, at the gas station here at Bed Nash. Yeah. Um, there was some sort of altercation where a I, guy was trying to rob him. Oh, guy. Oh, yes, guy. Yeah. The one up here at the gas Sure. Okay, so. Jerry uh, Garcia. Is that his real name? That's okay. what he says. Okay. Well, um, I guess there was some sort of altercation and someone tried to rob him and he fell against the tank and his oh. brain, brain bleed now. Oh, really? So he's home, I guess, but he has to go back and be retested. So he won't be working there for a little while. 
The guy at Bed Nash is he dresses up like a banana or yeah, whatever the holiday is. He's yeah. The holiday. yeah. yeah. He's a real nice guy. It's him. And he, I guess someone tried to rob him. They, they were beating him up, yeah, like, like and he hit his head against the tank. Yeah. And that's the thing. Yeah. All right. Anybody else? The nicest guy you'd ever meet. Literally. It's amazing. That's where he was this morning. Okay. Pardon? That's his name? It's amazing. Pardon? He just said. Well, Lisa just said about that guy. Yeah. That man. It's amazing, amazing. Right here in this little town. Yeah, right. Yeah. Yeah. Anybody else? Okay, folks, glad you're all here today. Let's turn our emeralds number 41. Let's all stand and sing.
who has enabled you to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. He has rescued us from the power of darkness, transferred us into the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For in him all things in heaven and earth were created, things visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or powers. All things have been created through him and for him. Thank you, y'all. Thank you. Now let's bow our heads, we'll have a word of prayer. <clears throat> our gracious God, what a privilege it is to gather together here this morning. Here in this old house, where folk since 1895 have been gathering under this roof to worship you and honor you, <coughs> bring you thanks and praise. All things have passed through here. Lives have come and lives have gone. Families have been raised and, and gone to be with you. Moved on to so many different things that take taken place here, Lord. But the good news is you never ever fail. And you always watch over us and you always do the best thing. Our Heavenly Father, we're so grateful that we can rely on your perspective and not ours. Because from down here we see things that just crush us and hurt us deeply. And from down here we experience things right within our own bodies. Our bodies are a part of this creation which is under the curse. And we will indeed die. But the good news is, in Christ Jesus there is eternal life. And death becomes a portal to go with you. And be with you forever in peace and in glory and in joy and escape this world of sickness and sin and darkness and lostness. And go to the place of light where Jesus Christ lives and reigns forever until the day he brings his kingdom to this earth and banishes all that is dark. And we live and reign with him forever. We look forward to those days, Lord, but in the midst of that right now, we're asking you to come to our friends and family and bring great help. We're thinking, first of all, a little Luke Benjamin here today, Lord. We pray that you put your healing hand upon this little baby. Lord, you breathe the breath of life into a handful of dirt thousands and thousands of years ago. And from that handful of dirt and from that breath of life, we're all here. And the population of the world and every man, woman, and child that's ever been. So we pray that you breathe life and health and strength into this little baby. And our Heavenly Father, we pray that his lungs might just cleanse and clarify and, and come to strength and come to maturity and that the little baby might be able to do everything he needs to do, be healthy and whole and strong. And we pray that his appetite might come and whatever is necessary, Lord, in that little tiny body that you have created, that, that thing might work perfectly. So our Heavenly Father, we're putting little roof in your hands and we ask you to be with mom and dad and the whole family and bring them encouragement and strength and hope. Our Heavenly Father, you know the very best thing to do, but we humbly ask you to heal this little child. We're also thinking of our buddy Bob Smith, who has held forth your word faithfully and with honor and integrity for decades. We're so glad, Lord, that uh, the Smiths have had a connection with this church over the years, over the decades, and we ask you to restore Bob to health and send him home real soon and make him comfortable and strong and healthy. We're also thinking, Lord, of all those on our prayer list. There, there are many names here. Our buddy Jeff Swaggart's going for surgery tomorrow, triple bypass. We pray that he might get a great result and that the things that need to fall into place might just fall into place as easy as pie. Or if there's obstacles and uh, things go wrong, and uh, we pray, Father, that you would come upon the whole situation and turn the, the impossible into the very, very possible. You are the one who does that. That's why we have hope, Lord. I mean, without you, we just don't have any hope. Without you, we don't have any life. We have no life. We have no tomorrow. We have no nothing. 
But in Christ Jesus, we've been promised eternity. So our Father, pour out the Holy Spirit upon our friends and family here, those that need healing, those that need comfort and encouragement. We pray that your Holy Spirit might speak to each and every one of our hearts and give us the wisdom to see beyond who we are and, and take advantage of your eternal wisdom and make good choices and good decisions and be the people we ought to be down here in this world. <coughs> our Heavenly Father, we can call out the darkness and point out this, that, and the other thing that is so wrong and the fallen world we live in. But our Heavenly Father, you have told us that we are a light in the Lord. And we ask you to help us to live up to that light and be the people who bring that light to bear upon this world. We're praying here this morning for our friends out in Glen Ritchie. We ask you to watch over these folk and take care of them. Again, that that might be a lighthouse in that community and that their pastor might uh, truly continue to enjoy the power of the Spirit of God come upon him as he preaches the Word. We're thinking of our friend Ron Anderson over there in Spain, his work with European Christian Mission. We ask you to continue to bless and use him for your glory, organizing and uh, leading leaders. And we're thinking of our friend Ray Compton. We're so grateful for his fellowship on that evening cafe. and uh, He's there just about every night, along with Anne Marie. And we just ask you deepest and richest blessing upon really the both of them. First of all, Raymond, we ask you to bring him strength and consistent health. We pray that he might be able to not go back and forth to the hospital all the time, but be stably at home, comfortable and confident about his health. And then we think of Anne Marie Compton, and we ask a special blessing on her. That woman does the work of angels. And she and her breed are the best of the best down here in this world. We ask you to bless and watch over her and continue to use her for your glory. And we pray our Heavenly Father that we might take it, a dose of her spirit, the spirit of giving, the spirit of service, the spirit of self-renunciation, uh, self really, to do the things of God for the people around her. Our Heavenly Father, we pray for our country. Pray for our leaders, pray for our United States Armed Forces and uh, law enforcement agents, <coughs> rescue workers, people working in hospitals, these ones that bring comfort and help and hope in nursing homes, each and every one who shows up every day to try and make the world a little bit better and make this a better civilization. We ask your hand upon each and every one. Our Heavenly Father, we can pray all day and be a worthy enterprise. We're going to leave our prayers to these. We're going to ask you to hear and answer all our prayers. Listen to our hearts as we say together, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, and thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our temptations, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. The night is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Anybody have a word of testimony? Sing. <laughs> when Joy says yes, let's sing. You know it. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, what I want to do today is uh, turn, everybody turn to 283 and we're going to sing it without music. Oh, uh, oh. for a change. We want to hear you. You can be our choir today. You know this song, it's an old one, and whatever. Uh, who's first to tell us what, what song it is? What's the number? Power in the 283. Power in the okay, we want to sing all uh, four verses, okay? And let's all stand let's as we all sing. Let's all stand as we sing, okay? And so soon as you can sing with us, we're going to sing without you. Tell me the old story. Okay. Would you be free from the burden and the sin? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Would you worry for what victory win? There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the blood. 
red, put cleanse black, and make you white. That's a miracle in itself, right? So before God, repenting, and I say we need a daily dipping, okay? Because we accumulate a lot of debris through the day, and not just by doing things, it's by not doing things that we should, okay? So we have to be uh, daily dipping and ask God for forgiveness for what we've done and what we haven't done. So uh, it's just wonderful that this power is available to us and we don't take use of it. We go around uh, the air out of our balloon sometimes. You know, when we should have them filled with helium, it'll last longer. <laughs> so, but thank you for cooperating and uh, being our special today. <laughs> now, Reverend, your turn. <laughs> he said. That was a good idea, Joyce. I thought that was great. I have one once in a while. <laughs> When I first got saved at the Johnson City Church, um, they used to have a thing they called Men's Prayer Band. They had prayer meeting on Wednesday, but on Tuesday night, they had Men's Prayer Band. And it was uh, Paul Sutter. One other man used to come to it or two, and a man named Floyd Harvey. Oh, yeah. Floyd used to live in the house right across the street from here. But when I knew him, he was a 79-year-old man, and uh, we used to sing, they, they would sing uh, their songs, the three, four, or five of us, uh, with no music, uh, it was just voices. Floyd had the gravelliest voice you ever heard in your life, but it was great. And uh, it was a throwback right here to that. What a great thing. You can look with me if you look, uh, like in your inside, left-hand side of your Bible, where it says Matthew, 3, 1 through 17. We we'll talk about John the Baptist here today. And I think we'll have a word of prayer before we start. Father, thank you so much for this day and the blessings of it. And our Heavenly Father, you know who we are down here. We're just ordinary folk. <coughs> but you have chosen to covenant with us. In other words, enter into a personal and dynamic and living relationship. Uh, we know you as God, the creator of heaven and earth, the overseer of all things, the sustainer of all things. You've made us to be known you as God. We know you as our Father in heaven, above all things, the Father who takes care of us, and looks over us, sees what provided for and never ever fails us. We also know you as Savior. You sent your Son into this world that he might reveal to us your saving grace and in a way that never could have been done without him. He's revealed you as our King. In Christ Jesus, we have a King of kings and Lord of lords who's above and beyond all. And so our Heavenly Father, when we gather together here, we ask you to come and speak to us not just as Father, not just as God. You would reveal yourself as Savior. But the good news is you call us friends. And you also call us your brethren. Your desire is not just to be a distant God. Your desire is to be intimately involved in our lives and our career through this world. So our Heavenly Father, we pray that you pour that spirit out upon us here this morning. Speak to us about the things that are really important, about the things that really aren't. And speak to us about you, that we might order our lives to walk with you here in this world. We'll thank you forever in Jesus' name. Amen. Just read a few verses here out of your bulletin. In those days, John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness of Judea, proclaiming, Repent! The kingdom of heaven has come near. And this is the one whom the prophet Isaiah spoke when he said, 
the voice of one crying out in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord and make his path straight. John's clothing was camel's hair and a leather belt around his waist. His food was locusts and wild honey. When the people of Jerusalem and all Judea were going out to him in all the regions <clears throat> along the Jordan, they were baptized by him in the river Jordan. They were confessing their sins. <clears throat> when he saw the Pharisees and the Sadducees, the religious elite, social leaders, societal leaders, when he saw them coming for baptism, he said to them, Well, you brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? You better bear fruit worthy of repentance. Don't expect to say to yourselves, Well, we have Abraham as our ancestor, because I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children to Abraham. And even now the axe is lying at the root of the trees. And every tree, therefore, that doesn't bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. So I baptize you with water for repentance. But one who is more powerful than I is coming after me. And I'm not even worthy to carry his sandals, John said. He can to baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. And his winnowing fork is in his hand. And he'll clear his threshing floor. And will gather his wheat into the granary. But the chaff he'll burn with unquenchable fire. Jesus came from Galilee to John at the Jordan to be baptized by him. John would have prevented him. He said, you know, I need to be baptized by you. And you come to me. But Jesus said to him, let it be so now. For it is proper for us in this way to fulfill all righteousness. And he consented. And when Jesus had been baptized, just as he came up from the water, suddenly the heavens were opened to him. And he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him. And a voice from heaven said, This is my Son, the Beloved, with whom I am well pleased. We started out in this Gospel, we saw in the very first words, okay? Remember we looked at the uh, genealogy here. And the very first words of the Gospel of Matthew are the account of the genealogy, the Genesis, remember? Of Jesus the Messiah. All right? Remember what that word Messiah means? Messiah is a Hebrew word that means anointed. Christ is a Greek word that means anointed. Remember what happens when we coronate a king? We put a crown on their head and say, we've just officially recognized this person as our king. In ancient days, they poured oil out of a horn over the head of the person who was to be king. And when they poured that anointing oil over their head, that was a christening. It was a messiah king, if you will. They were identifying him as the king. The first words of the Gospel of Matthew are cultural code words that Jesus Christ is the coming king. And then we went through this genealogy. They keep genealogies for kings, okay? Ordinary folk, it's not as important, but for kings, it's important that you come from the line of royalty, that you come from the line of authority, because it's believed that the hand of God is upon the king and his family. And so Jesus is identified then again as king. The birth of Jesus took place in this way. His mother Mary, remember? She, the Spirit of God came upon her, and she would bear this child. And what would Herod do? What was his response, remember? Where's this one who was born king of the Jews? Wise men came looking for him. They said, we saw a star in the east. When they came looking for the Christ, for the Messiah, for the king, the one who would be born king of the Jews, Herod said, when you find out where he is, you tell me where he is. Because I want to go and worship him, but that's not what Herod was interested in, because Herod's a part of this world system this spirit of antichrist, this spirit that, how about this word, these words from the epistle, first epistle of John. <laughs> Description, Herod's a living, breathing example of how desperately we need Christ to come. The apostle John wrote this, 
We know that we're under we are God's children and that the whole world lies under the power of the evil one. That's the first epistle of John, chapter 5, verse 19. What's the world's condition from God's perspective? Right? Did you look down and see, uh, oh, whoa, look at the great progress they're making down on earth. Why, they, they don't just have a wheel. They have inflatable tires. And they go in there and they want. And they get in airplanes that fly through the skies. What a wonder, what a magnificent thing. Meanwhile, God speaks words and the birds fill the heavens. And God speaks words and stars take their place. God speaks words and somebody looks up and they see the moon and they take a picture of the moon and there's a magnificent thing there and it turns out it's the planet Venus. God just speaks and these things come. We down here, ha, The whole world lies under the power of the evil one. How about God's assessment of the world back in the book of Genesis? You know, Garden of Eden, right? A couple days out of the Garden of Eden, who knows how long. First man ever born on earth, right? That we are told about in the Bible. Cain and Abel. First man born, Cain murdered. That's the world we live in. The first man born that we know of on earth. His name was Cain. And he was jealous and hated his brother. He said, why don't we go out in the field? And he killed him, his own brother. Book of Genesis in chapter five, God was speaking to Noah. And the Bible says in chapter six, verse five, the Lord saw that the wickedness of humankind was great in the earth, and that every inclination of the thoughts of their hearts was only evil continually. And the Lord was sorry that he had made humankind on the earth, and it grieved him to his heart. And then drop down a few lines later. Chapter six, verse nine, these are the descendants of Noah. Noah was a righteous man. He was blameless in his generation. Noah walked with God. Three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And then it says, now the earth was corrupt in God's sight. That's one. The earth was corrupt in God's sight. And the earth was filled with violence. That's two. And God saw that the earth was corrupt. Three. For all flesh had, flesh had corrupted its way in the earth. Four. And God said to Noah, I have determined to make an end of all flesh, for the earth is filled with violence because of them. Five. And I'm going to destroy the earth so you make yourself an ark. We are so used to living in a lost and fallen world. We're just used to it. And yet all around us every day are signs of wickedness and evil and corrupt. What are you talking about, Rev? What, what, what do you mean in wickedness? Are you talking about a guy over here? You've got to get mugged and robbed and maybe knocked out or whatever. And that's a stark vision. But how about the idea that we think we can do it with God? That's what real corruption is. It's the idea that we can live our lives without God and <coughs> it's okay. Because everything looks like it's okay. Because we're going to live forever, aren't we? Yeah, we're never going to die. Some, that's always somebody else who dies. It's somebody else that was in the name in the paper this morning. It wasn't ours. It was somebody who lived over there. Somebody down the street. Somebody in Hollywood. Somebody in Nashville. Oh, Hollywood. How about the submarine thing? <coughs> Kind of crazy, isn't it? Stupid, <laughs> Stupid you say. Yep. <laughs> and uh, did you hear about the submarine? Now, how many people died in that thing? Five. Five. five people died. Are our hearts broken that five people died? 
Not really. It's an oddity. It's a curiosity. And it's like, ah, those rich people, rich people, they'll find something to do one way or another. And now look what happened. And it's virtually a joke. But five people died. But we're not broken up about it. We click on the computer, read the little thing. Wow, look at that. That submarine, it looks a little like the penguin on Batman submarine. It's got kind of a fleshy tail. That's curious. And, well, I bet you, as soon as the water got in there, their bodies were probably just crushed. They were just crushed immediately. And people tell us how deep the ocean is because of it, and what the water pressure might be down there, and, and that's all. Let's click over and see what's on Facebook. Oh, look at this, is so funny here. We forgot all about it. Don't we? And if there's a hurricane, goes through Florida, destroys houses, neighborhoods, multiple people die, people are hurt, injured, crippled for life. We read about it, but boy, that hangout on my thumb is bothering me. I wish I hadn't pulled it so much and turned it into a bloody mess. I always do. Yeah. Oh, isn't that something? What are we gonna have for dinner? And we think next to nothing about it. That's how far separate, we don't have any idea how far separated we are from God. We don't have any idea how magnificent it is that God should look and say, you know what? Again, maybe the greatest words that were ever spoken on this planet Earth were Jesus, the Bible says he was being crucified. Now I don't know if they had laid the cross on the ground and they, how's your back? Well, they took him and they put him down on that cross just to start, right? After torturing him, beating him, humiliating him, embarrassing him, they put him down on the board and then proceeded to nail his hands in place, drive the nails through his feet, hang him up above the ground. <clears throat> and the people standing around, instead of saying, oh, God, that poor man. What could anybody have done to deserve this? Instead, they're standing around and saying, gee, I wonder if the prophet Elijah could have come. Hey, let's give him, you know, some of this vinegar. Uh, you might keep him awake for a little while. And maybe we'll see some more. <coughs> let's poke the lion in the cage and see if we can annoy him and bother him a little bit. And Jesus looked down at the people he spoke into being. And this is a little carnival. It's a little festival, or maybe a big one, I don't know. But this man's hanging off the cross, looking down at all this going on, and you know what he says? Father, forgive them, they don't know what they're doing. That's why we have hope in this world. That's why we, and I quote, and I mean it, have a prayer. Because Jesus Christ has revealed to us the mercy of God that is so all-powerful and devastatingly genuine that he should look down into this world and his assessment is the whole world, New Testament, the whole world lies under the power of the evil one. They think of themselves and not me continually. They don't have time for me. They got time for everything in the world. But boy, to get any time with the people that I love, with the people that I want to spend eternity with, with the people that I created. That's another story. The good news is we have a king who is merciful, gracious, loving. When Moses went up the mountain, what did he say? Remember when God said, you know what Moses? Moses was supposed to lead the people to the promised land. And he goes up on the mountain to get the Ten Commandments. And before he even gets back down to the mountain, they got, they said, well, you know what? Let's make a God like everybody else's God. This God Moses tells us about, we don't see him. He's not here. Let's gather all the gold we can get. And we'll make a God out of gold. 
Because that's the best thing we got down here in this world. And we all worship gold, precious things, the possessions of this world, everything we see down here in this world. And, and the more we can get, the better we can get. So Moses, eh, who knows where he is. Uh, let's worship this golden calf. And Moses comes down and he smashes the commandments. And he said, lead him to the promised land. Lord, not only is this not working, not only are they not interested in what I'm doing, not only are they telling me from time to time, Moses, you and your God can take a hike. You promised us redemption. You promised us freedom. You promised us that you'd bring us to be with you. And you know what? It's just gotten worse. You know the feeling? You ever know the feeling? Lord, we've been praying desperately for help. And it doesn't look like it's coming. Lord, we don't have any hope except you. And we're praying to you. And Lord, we need your help. And God looks from his eternal throne and says, I know. I'm going to send my son down there and he's going to reveal to you that I hurt just like you do. And whatever I do, you're going to have to learn that it's the best. No matter what it is. No matter what you think it is. No matter whether you say, Lord, why don't you answer our prayers? You know, like the prophet Habakkuk said, like King David said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Like Jesus said on the cross himself, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? What did I do wrong? Where did I go astray? Has there ever been a time, Lord, and I'm talking Jesus, not someone of us. We're entitled to doubt ourselves, to be confused, to wonder, to throw up our hands. We don't have much confidence in ourselves when it really comes to it, and we really shouldn't. But Jesus says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? What did Jesus do wrong? Well, he sat on his eternal throne in heaven, right? And he spoke the world into being. And then Jesus said one day, I guess in eternity, so to speak, Jesus said, Lord, Dad, they've all gone astray. They don't have a sheep. I mean, there's sheep without a shepherd down there. And the eternal Father said, Son, you're the King of kings and Lord of lords. What do you think you should do? One day they said, well, you know, let's try and wipe off the planet Earth. Let's cleanse the whole thing. We'll send a flood. And we'll choose the one righteous man that we can find. And we'll save him and his family, by the way. You think you don't have influence. Noah, the Bible doesn't say Noah. You and your family are so just. I'm going to, no, Noah, you're righteous. And because of what you are, I'm going to bring blessing onto your family. You bring godly influence on the people around you. But one day God from his throne said, here, let's, let's demonstrate to the world what's really going on here. We'll wipe off earth. We'll flood everything away and leave just Noah. And shortly after Noah got off the ark, his daughters were trying to have children by him, He's drunk, so he doesn't know what's going on. And we find out that the very best of us live in confusion. The very best of us live in disorientation. The very best of us put a mask on every day and go about and try and convince ourselves and the world that we've got it under control. We either do it by being overly cruel and mean so nobody will get close enough to see how deeply we're hurt. Or we are like the ultimate victim so that hopefully people will see how bad we have it and they'll have mercy upon us and they won't pick on us and they won't aggravate how bad we really feel about things. And so we're gonna to present to the world 
a different face than what we have inside. The very best of us got off the ark and proceeded to bring the world right back to where it was when, when the flood started. Because the problem is deeper than our best, entry, our best efforts. The problem is deeper than our discipline. The, positive, the problem is deeper than our, and I, I'll never forget when I, before I got saved, just before I got saved, reading the radio Bible class tract. And I had read about being born again, and I thought, well, you know what? We went to church every Sunday when I was a kid. I was an altar boy. And <clears throat> my mom would teach CCD, that's the Catholic equivalent of Sunday school. And we went to CCD classes every Thursday. I mean, I was as Catholic as you could be, really. Uh, but I didn't know anything about the Lord, really. I knew about it, but I didn't know. And I didn't live any kind of life that would honor God. I lived the life that everybody around me lived. And we just did what we felt. And there was a few people here and there, like Grandma or Dad, or different ones. You know, you'd look around and say, well, they really, they live a just life. But not me. And certainly not my friends. And then I read about being born again. And I thought, that's what I need. I need God to change me from the inside because I keep trying to change me from the outside and it isn't working. And then I read in the book of, called Twice Born Men from Radio Bible Class. It said, you know what? If you're born again, you know it. If you're really born again, the Spirit of God witnesses with your spirit that you're a child of God. And if you're really born again, you don't say, well, today I think I'm saved. And then tomorrow morning you say, I'm not sure if I'm saved. And then the next day you say, well, you know, I don't just, uh, well, I'm not going to worry about it today. And it comes and goes, this is not it. That's not it. It's an abiding presence of God that comes into the heart of a man or a or a child and brings and, and convinces you in your heart that you're a child of God. The Spirit of God witnesses with our spirit that we are a child of God. Okay? And I read that and it said, it's not pulling yourself up by your bootstraps. This is something you cry out to God for. And he gives it as a gift. And I thought, wow. Yeah, I was in church every Sunday. Yeah, I went to CCD all the time. Yeah, we had all the religious stuff around our house that, you know, Catholic Christian people have. You know, the pictures of angels watching us walk over the broken bridge, uh, the face of Jesus up on the wall, uh, you know, prayer books and Bibles and everything else. But I'm not born again, because according to this, I really don't know it. And according to this, it's not an abiding presence. So I guess I'm really not born again. And then I used to go to bed at night, drunk, stoned, and say, God, why do I keep doing the same stupid things over and over again? Would you please help me? Would you please come into my life? I want to be born again. I remember laying in the bed in Owego, New York, with a, a recessed part here on this side of the bed, because it's an old mattress and saying, Lord, I don't know how to do this. You gotta do this. And that's when Jesus came into my, excuse me, came into my life. It was June 14, 1982. He came in and saved my soul. I don't know what I was doing. I was just asking God to please help me. Because Lord, I've been looking at my life and this is no life. And I've been, looking at the way I've treated the people around me and, and he, it's not the way you're supposed to do it. And I look over at mom and dad and I think how poorly I treat them and how good they've been to me. Lord, I don't want to be this way anymore. Would you please change me? And he does. Because we have a king. But our king is not a king who's still sitting on his throne. He's the king who was sitting on the throne and looks down and says, well, we wiped off the earth, but that 
We knew what was going to happen. Jesus says to his father, now they know. Now the only hope is that I get off of this throne and go down there and become one of them. And when I do, they're going to reject me. I'm going to come to my own and my own will receive me not. I'm going to go to the inn as an infant. Like I said, we don't have room for you. And it's going to be a sign and a seal of what the rest of my life is going to be like. They're going to take me from <coughs> their home in German, Pennsylvania. And they're going to lead me up to the cliff and try to shove me off of it. Because I had the gall to tell them that God loves every last man, woman, and child, whether he's Chinese, whether he's Japanese, whether he's an Arab, whether he's a German, whether he's a Russian, whether he's a Jew, whether he's an English man, whether he's white, or whatever he is, God loves every last one of them. And they don't want to hear that. They want to hear that God loves me and only me. And so they try and push him off the cliff. But he passed through because it wasn't his time. And then he would ultimately willingly go to the cross to surrender himself on our behalf. That's our king. Our king doesn't hang from the cross and say, now watch and fly off the cross in power and destroy those miserable creatures. But instead, our God says, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. Father, into my, your hands I commend my spirit. And the world said, see, he's no Messiah. The Messiah can't die. The Messiah lives forever. No, that's not God's idea of a Messiah. That's your idea of a Messiah. That's your idea of a Savior. You think that's how God would act. But that's not the God who passed before Moses. And when Moses saw him from that cleft of the rock, Moses said, Lord, I only see the backward parts of you. But here's what I see. The Lord, the Lord, merciful and gracious. That's God. That's our God. So to anger. Praise the living God, abounding in loving kindness and truth and forgiveness of sins to a thousand generations. Did you get it? That's our God. Forgiveness of sins. He came to seek and to save the lost. He came to seek and to save those who were under the power of the devil. He came to seek and to save that world that is only evil and only corrupt continually. Was it five or six times? He came to seek and to save the world that all, Paul says, like sheep have gone astray. They've all wandered off. And the Apostle Paul would write and say, God has condemned every single one of us to sin. He has condemned every last one of us to death so that His grace can be available to every single one. Amen. Amen is right. Amen is right. Repent, because the kingdom of heaven is near. It's nearer than you imagine. This is the one of whom the prophet Isaiah spoke. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord and make his path straight. Caesar's coming to town. The president's coming. Clean the streets. Sweep them up. Power wash the front of your house. Make everything look good. Fill the potholes. Make sure when Caesar or the president, or the king comes. He sees what fine and upstanding people we are and what a beautiful community we are and bring out the best food and the best of everything for him. The best going hawk to make sure the king's taken care of. And John the Baptist shows up and he's wearing camel's hair clothing and a leather belt and he's eating wild honey Field hunger is what the Greek calls it. And he's re eating what? What are they, Joyce? Locusts. Yeah, bugs. That's the other word for bugs. I don't even know if they dipped them in chocolate. Right? Now he came out of the desert like a desert man. And he showed up. 
And the power of God was upon him. Not the power of this world. He was an outsider. And he said, you repent because the kingdom of God is at hand. And the people said, you know what? We've heard the fancy scribes and Pharisees and the intelligentsia and all they have to say and all they've done is just about ruined everything they've touched. But this guy here, oh, they'll cut his head off before it's over because the world loves its own and despises the things of God. Yeah, they'll throw him in jail before it's over. But you know what? The power of God is upon that man. The hand of God is upon him. John, what do we need to do? You need to repent. You need to change your mind about the way you're living. You need to change your attitude. You need to change your behavior. You need to change the way you think about God. You need to stop ignoring him and stop running away from him and cling to him and fly to him. And if you do, you'll find life. And if you don't, you'll never know life. Repent, because the kingdom of God is at hand. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your holy word. Because, Lord, we're just regular people down here. Without you, we have no hope. Without you, we have no help. And you tell us, here's what I want you to do. Come unto me, all you who are weary, and are burdened down and worn out and tired of this painful, ugly life down here that we have distorted and ruined from your perspective. But we're so used to it that we don't even realize how distorted and ruined it is. But our Heavenly Father, speak to us about these things. That by the power of the Spirit of God, we might walk with you, be with you, give our families to you, give our lives to you, turn everything over to you, and let you be our God. And we'll enjoy life that we never, ever had before. It's all by faith. It's all by grace. It's all because our God is the one who hangs from the cross in our place and says, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. Would you please speak to us about these things in Jesus' name? And we'll thank you forever. Amen. Ladies and gentlemen, let's turn our hymnals to 320. Three, two, all. Well, let's all stand.
for the rest of our days. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.